Good evening and welcome to the virtual home of Princeton Public Library here on Crowdcast. My name is Madeline Rosenberg and I'm the Public Humanities Specialist at the Princeton Public Library. It's my pleasure to host tonight's program, Poets at the Library. The program is presented in partnership with DVP, US One Poets and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight's featured readers are Madhur Anand and Phil Philip Holmes. I'll introduce both poets before the readings begin. They'll each read for about 20 minutes and after they've read, we'll have an open mic with those readers who signed up in advance to share one poem. I should note that this event is being recorded and our events typically go on the library's YouTube channel. And one quick housekeeping note, we recommend that you use Chrome for this experience and close any other tabs that aren't necessary, especially any that might be playing audio or video. Please try not to have multiple Crowdcast tabs open at the same time. Our first reader will be Madhur Anand. Anand is the author of the Book of Poems, A New Index for Predicting Catastrophes and the experimental memoir, This Red Lion Goes Straight to Your Heart, both considered trailblazing in their synthesis of art and science. A New Index was a finalist for the 2016 Trillium Book Award for Poetry. This Red Lion won the 2020 Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction. Her second collection of poems will be published by McC McClelland and Stewart in spring 2022. She's a full professor of ecology at the University of Guelph and was appointed the inaugural directory, director of the Guelph Institute for Environmental Research. Philip Holmes has published four collections of poetry, three sections of poems, A Place to Stand, The Green Road, and Light Lighting the Steps, all with Anvil Press. The first two are out of print. The others are available from Kakarnet. I hope that I'm pronouncing that right. I should have checked press um, in Manchester, United Kingdom. Holmes is Emeritus Professor of Applied and Computational Mathematics and Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and was a member of the Neuroscience Institute at Princeton University. He studied engineering at Oxford and Southampton Universities in the United Kingdom and taught at Cornell University from 1977 to 1994 before moving to Princeton. He has worked on nonlinear dynamical systems and collabor collaborated with engineers, biomechanics, and neuroscientists. Holmes is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, the American Physical Society, and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. I'm now going to minimize my screen and welcome Madhur to, to the stage. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. And thank you, Madeline, for that introduction and for inviting me uh, to your series. Um, I, um, I spent a little bit of time in Princeton on sabbatical, and it was at that time that I, um, I joined the US One Poets Collective. And um, I don't know if any of you are still here and recognize me, it was, a, it was quite a long time ago. And I, um, and I very much enjoyed visiting the library. So I, um, I, can, I, can, I can visualize being there. Um, I'm gonna read to you a little bit from my three books, um, just a tiny bit from each one. Uh, so as, uh, as mentioned, my first book of poems is called A New Index for Predicting Catastrophes. I'm going to read you three poems. Cantarellis. We were boring jack pines, storing their cores in plastic drinking straws. It had been raining. I'm no naturalist, but understand the association of fungi and forests their partiality for recent rain. I don't know birds or bark, but once grasped indifference by the neck, such that when I saw them, creamy orange against first brown, then gray, then green, I was 95% sure. I brushed aside soil, lichen, moss, placed them into yellow hard hats. Later, we would discern which tree rings were false. Of greater concern was my own mortality and mushrooms, I decided, were true. Forward, backward procedure. Because we simply do not have enough information a priori, because no sequence is emitted, no conservative lower bound. Because the annual cycling might represent a recurring disturbance. Because well-known abilities can be masked. 
We have no framework for dealing with the shortcomings, the curve as it approaches zero. There are four problems that must be solved. Drought, power, psychology, and light. How many states should the final model have? So that poem entitled Forward Backward Procedure, um, all of the words that I used in that poem are found from the text of one of my own scientific articles, uh, Tucker and Anand, on the use of, of stationary versus hidden Markov models to detect simple versus complex ecological dynamics, uh, published in the journal Ecological Modeling. And finally, Hill Country, Old Mercedes, and Partuition. There's a new index for predicting catastrophes. It's the decreasing rate of recovery from small perturbations. The critical slowing down before a tipping point. Like taking a picture when I leave out the wire fence and then move in for a close up of the Brangus cow standing right behind it. I'm taught she's been bred for her disease resistance, tolerance to heat and outstanding maternal instincts. I look for the three eighths Brahmin traces of shared ancestry. It's autumn. I've flown to Texas to meet my future father-in-law. The vistas are simple and golden. But then this brown cow appears, stands too still, becomes time, consuming. That's when I see signs. She's just given birth. <clears throat> Excuse me. My second book is a book of prose, poetic prose. Uh, it's an experimental memoir entitled This Red Line Goes Straight to Your Heart. It's written in two parts. Uh, the first half of the book uh, tells the stories of my parents' lives in, um, in the first person, alternating in the voices of my parents. And then as you get halfway uh, into the book, you have to physically uh, flip it over. And there's a second part, a second book that's written in my voice and um, it uh, reflects back on their generation and on, on life uh, becoming a, a poet and a scientist. So it traces, they, they were immigrants, uh, refugees first um, after the partitioning of India into Pakistan and India in the 1947 and then um, immigrants to, to Canada and it tells a lot of stories using uh, the lenses of poetry and science. I'm going to read you a very, very short piece from my side that I think kind of articulates the entire ambition of the project. It's entitled The Theorem of Friends and Strangers. Let me tell you something that is true, but you will not believe it. Take a group of six people, say at a party, if you pick three within that group, they will turn out to be either mutual friends or mutual strangers. Another. In any big city, New Delhi, let me say, or no, let me say Toronto, there must be at least two people with the same number of hairs on their heads. Another. Mark five dots randomly on a piece of paper and it will result in at least four of them being able to trace a four-sided figure. Ramsey's theory, the, the larger theory to which the theorem of friends and strangers belongs, allows us to find structure in apparently random sets. Partition regularity, more specifically, allows us to take a set, partition it into some finite number of pieces, and then try to say as much as possible about those pieces. I have hundreds of pieces, fragments of thoughts. I want to say as much as possible with them. I want to find some application of Ramsey's theory for that. So that everyone in the subset is either a friend or a stranger. I want to find that person in New Delhi or Toronto who has the same number of hairs on their head as mine. 
I want to match every feeling in one partition with its mirror image in the second. I want to trace that four-sided figure, a country's border, drawn by connecting a number of arbitrary dots, the past meeting the future. So my third book, my second book of poems is coming out next month. It's entitled Parasitic Oscillations. And um, it started with an obsessive reading with the discovery of a book by um, this title, The Nests and Eggs of Indian Birds. Um, around the time of writing the experimental memoir, I was of course contemplating um, my ancestry. Um, and this title appeared as uh, something that I felt would contain uh, an entire book of poems in and of itself. Uh, it was, it's, a, it's a 19th century book of natural history uh, written by Alan Octavian Hume, who was a British civil servant in India and um, the father of Indian ornithology, collected thousands and thousands of bird skins and eggs. I became obsessed with that. I visited these um, museum collections in uh, the UK and in um, New York. And several years later, I have a book of, of poems. I don't have the, the hard copy with me yet. I'm going to read you, um, I think, two or three poems from, from that book. The first one is entitled, White Throated Laughing Thrush Caught in My Throat. From April to June, I watched the American Robin's theoretical eggs on the northwest corner of my front porch while reading about another bird theoretically laying her eggs, a deep and beautiful green shining as if recently varnished in the lower southern ranges of the Himalayas. My father's sister, my bua, lives there. She went to the beauty parlor to have her face bleached, but it turned blue like Krishna's or like robin eggs in the sense that no one can explain precisely why. When she came for my wedding, everyone asked one another if they had seen her face, and only I answered, no. Years later, when her husband died, I called her on my father's assist insistence. I could not say any words beyond my own Sanskrit name, as if it were a song, like shades of blue when they fall through cracks. Their notes, though rather harsh, are very varied and quite conversational, said Colonel J.F. Marshall in The Nests and Eggs of Indian Birds. The old bird will remain on the nest until within reach of the hand, remarked Captain Hutton. Do not call if you have nothing to say said my bua. Summations. He draws a crooked line connecting dime sailboats to quartered caribou. He erases it. The new line is straighter, thicker, blacker. It is how he becomes a crow how he is learning to fly. He must first perch, make obtuse angles with his feet. He must imprint, must carry over double digits with what remains of his ambition, his American father. Then he may attempt the word problems, the other word problems, world problems, the small, matter of Benji's length of rope, Cindy's 10 apples, until all the units match, until he finds fewer apples, more or less rope, 
until he has solved for fiber, for the orchard. His teacher writes, learning how to make change is one of the hardest things we will tackle this year. He brings his summations, his correctable errors. But ambition is a bitch, is A.O.O. Hume's notes on life histories of 700 bird species in 1883 at Rothney Castle in Shimla. They were stolen by his servant and sold as waste paper. Uh, finally, I will end on a, a found poem again, um, but this one was found within um, a scientific article I read because I, um, I, I ended up taking a, going to sort of to the extreme and bringing all this um, sort of extant uh, science to the present in terms of trying to understand the, the mathematics of birdsong. So the found, the article from which the, the text of this poem is found is, is um, entitled Simple Mo Motor Gestures for Bird Songs, published in Physical Review Letters by Gardner et al. And here's my found poem, a simple note. It is basically expected that time is a wave and history the darker diagram of clockwise arrows. Human speech is a subsong of trachea and beak. It is illustrated in this letter how pressure will control not only strength but also sound. It is expected there be some overlap, tension while mimicking lexicon, emphasis on power. All is transient and symmetric, the slowing curve, the fastest collisions, crossing out each syllable, each precise boundary, first backward, then forward, stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, we will now hear from Philip Holmes. So I'm going to minimize myself and bring him to the virtual stage. So <clears throat> I'll read, I'll start by reading uh, two poems from The Green Road, which was published uh, as, as my uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, third book. And, and they're about lead mining in Northern England. So there are some dialect words uh, and terms that need to be explained. The fells are hillsides, levels are shafts in layers of rock containing the lead ore. Water wheels drive bellows to make draft for ventilation. A kibble is a bucket to carry ore from the mine. And the first poem is called The Way In. The fells recover what they can, a part of what was picked and carried out. The square channel which fed the wheel is flush with a dark swell of nettles, and the marum grass seethes in the tail race. The engine house is bogged in sheep dung, and there's never the ghost of a shout or curse under all the wind's sway. But when John Stott came here, a dozen cottages huddled under the edge by Low Mill. He and his gang walked the four mile and back, starting their days by dawn. As they went, they knitted stockings, caps and comforters, which their wives would sell come Wednesdays at Newcom Market. The wind, which never rests, glimmered and cut at their quick fingers, their clogs crunched the skin of frost. A grouse whirred ten feet ahead. John's terrier was after it, out of sight and back before they had spoken. The stars are going out. In this first light you will almost miss the level's neat arch. Taking picks and kibbles from the shed, they go down in file. The last man enters 
and is gone. Now the sun can rake the golden grass. We now move to the smelting hearth. Uh, another another few um, uh, <coughs> uh, technical words. Browse is partly smelted ore used for starter smelt, and the sumpter pot is a heated cauldron that collects the molten lead before it's cast in molds. Here the water wheels drive bellows to, keep, to, to fan the smelting fire. The smelting heart. On the run of lead, they set an even layer of chop wood, then peats, brittle and black as the old moon. Firing at dusk, the flames shoot and lick back to the dull and bright pulse of the bellows as the big wheel shout, <coughs> bites and shudders. Behind the mill, the hills a scurry of wind and water. The skies pitch overhead from Shunafell. There's not a village or farm or working shaft ten mile upwind. Nothing beyond the track and cairns around Surrender Moss. The flu draws well in the northeast wind. The sheds soon warm in the hearth's glare. John scatters brouse from the last smelt and waits, turning it till the lead starts to sweat and the first new oars thrown on and the night's begun. These two are close as family. Richard works the pasty mass, his arms scorched in a white funnel of light. Shifting and raking, he feels his wet clothes dry and stiffen. The sour air catches at his throat he remembers watching the men rake and turn. He raked and turned. The heat smacked his face as his father moved aside. John steps out for air, picking his way among the tailings and dross and looks up to check the chimney a hundred feet uphill. Sparks and pale smoke blot in the damp wind. His eyes are now adjusted to the night. But beyond the noise and half light from the open door, he does not see a fox, which crosses the track and waits, one poor poised, and goes on down to Ivalet Farm. Below the mill, the tail race holds steady as the wheel's thrash shakes the stone edge of it. Within, there's not much said over the flu's dull boom, boom, creaking leather, the tang of grease on hot shafts, bottles passed from time to time. They exchange rake and tongs, going back to adjust the air blast to a nicety. The bright beads clump and press over the hearthstone to the sumter pot. It takes an hour to fill and then they ladle it into the long molds. It's 10 or 12 hours to melt a ton and months to get the ore. They've worked like this for years. When the ore's near done, Richard goes out and shuts the sluice. The wheel slows and rocks to a stop. In minutes, the moors, noises and the endless wind are back. The moon has set, the fox trots by, sated and unfearful. He blurs against the lightning fell, the bottle's done. They go out into the raw hour, the witch's hour, locking the mill door and leaving the rich silvered pigs cooling in their molds, a year's meat and bread. I'll now read uh, three short poems <clears throat> from my most recent book, Lighting the Steps. The first one <clears throat> is uh, about my step-grandmother. 
Edith Holmes, nay Lawson, was always propped most properly among plumped pillows in her dark Victorian bed. We called each second Sunday after church. Pink and shrunk as her crocheted bed jacket, she pressed my damp hand in her knotted own. A fly batted behind drawn curtains which swept the turkey carpet. Her hair was carefully arranged above the satin bows. Unseen for years, a day of rare heat, her garden throbbed outside. She asked me how was school. The house was called the Poplars, although the trees had long since gone. And I would take that long or longer to see that this was the elegant Edwardian girl pictured by the door at West Farm, holding father's pony. Near sight. I can't recall the age at which I realized it wasn't usual to close one eye and lose everything save the blurred edge of houses, threats, friends, yet to bring at once the beetle cocked upon a leaf five inches from my nose to perfect focus. I thought that anyone could at will and in this way shut out the greater swimming world. Mine slipped out of in and out of focus at the garden's ragged end where pillows of half-clipped thorn defended father's vegetables from Bo's cows and the pungent smoke of a damp-down fire, grass clippings, dead-headed roses, plots of weeds, hung for days as I went out and straggled back. <clears throat> Another short poem <clears throat> that starts in, uh, in York, England, and ends somewhere entirely different. Released from school for an hour and walking the city walls in slack November light, we, sh we saw four people burning a piano. An upright toppled on kindling. Old varnish flashed and boiled. The strings went lax and thuds and curious shrieks. A bottle made the rounds. We heard a fitful cheer. We? I have a notion of companions, but can't imagine who might have come on those long walks, escaping endless fellowship. Or why this memory should seize me now at 3 a.m., four figures in an afternoon beyond the moat, the music gone that might have been performed, all traffic momentarily still on a wholly other continent. I'll end this uh, section with uh, the garden engineer. Water will be your greatest challenge, an intractable medium to be coaxed sometimes miles and given the precise head to overcome running losses and at the end, raise a perfect fan over Newton's car. You must make pools to hold Narcissus' face long after he goes. Mirrors changeable as the sky, cascades which slip like silk across their lips, and others a broken-backed sliver of light deep on the leaves in Diana's grove. You will need valves and sluices to drain it for those northern winters when the valley's edge swoops to the bare quincunx and frost uncolors the lawns and raked valleys. How different from our comfortable mists where moss pads out the year. You must learn to level this and raise that with a hundred cartloads of boulders and earth as he dictates, to hide or reveal a distant tower, make way for a maze and summer houses where favorites can be met 
unobserved. You will imagine tall trees catching a wind which stills among their million leaves, leaving shade penned under them in pools where he might weigh the little countries and the great, and so determine matters of state among your tended beds. Thus, my young friend, cultivate most carefully technique and beauty, detail and the grand design. Quicken your skills by all means to match his passing pleasures. But look beyond the king's whim. It may last half a lifetime. Your garden, centuries. We now move to some uh, shorter poems. <clears throat> Models of mind. I think I know that brain creates the mind, but why is this so hard to see? Lips brush and leave a touch encoded or a taste. Spikes run from heel to head. We feel the clutch of signals taken up, released. A world of sense and memory from which all action springs. But there are scruples. Is correlation cause? And where am I? We've learned this much. If not bound by muscle, then by nerve. Each body makes the present from its past, affords a grasp against the day's assault, the waste of light. Yet it's provisional. Our models shift and slide leaving words to spare, but few to bring to mind. Retiring from research. Through earlier life, I never thought about the future shrinking, that a door could slam on what would hence remain unseen, undone. The begin was simple. We did not seek out among the many options. Times were not right to make routine investigations. Instead, ideas emerged and grew, transforming us. We prized chance meetings, rejoiced in questions to exploit. Now, those years contract in a sudden wrench. Along this quiet street, obscured by dusk, tight buds appear upon each winter branch, a promising display. Yet still there is a lack in which stray words fall unused on my desk. Can I make out a way and find a fitting task? Rereading some books. Even the sounds of their words seem distant. As I go back, rereading books once known well. Marginal notes leave little to reveal. Chapters have vanished, swept clean in an instant. Characters recalled are changed or else absent and already playing in different games. Staged encounters collapse on almost every page. Earlier conversations fail to repeat. Raindrops batter the hydrangeas blooms until the storm's done and the winds die down. Hesitating across borders of fading haze, a world was transformed with so little care, the passages bend under the weight of days. Not much remains. What did I learn there? Winter thoughts. How can I escape the sense of loss that builds and pulls against a stable state? 
it interrupts my writing, and coming late, it spreads an alien, depressive force. Could I uncover what was once a source of creativity? Ideas which dissipate ill-chosen words, and so avoid this fate? Leaves whisper in the year's slow-turning course. Now I must catch and read one of those leaves to bring this story to its end. Looking across a dormant lawn that stretches to bare trees, I feel it would be best to slow and pause, return, create each thought with greater care, and make time for new lines to rise, to share. And I will end with a poem called Music at Boca Kotorska, 1969. They say, with age comes wisdom, but for months now I find myself more often drawn backward towards memory's fragments in midday's bleach or at bird-wrapped dawn. Each recollection brings a further twist, shifting dates or places, linking what once had been discreet. There's little coherence, episodes unhinge, dividing most of what's left. The world then present dissolved into mist, leaving me waiting for something more were there trams, a busy road by the shore? Had the quartet played in a different town? Stark landscapes rose up from that coast. But still the road runs on, its end unknown. And I'd like to thank uh, <coughs> Madura for reading so wonderfully before I started. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you to both of our featured readers. And my apologies for the, the technical difficulties. We're very grateful that you stuck with us. Um, we will now shift gears to the open mic portion of tonight's e uh, program. And we're going to begin with Deborah Friedman. So I'm going to pull her up on stage and minimize myself. So just bear with us. Hi, I'm Deb Friedman, and this is Strange Rhyme for a Strange Time. This trick, the pandemic, lingers unlovely still. We feel depressed without will, hampered by isolation and close kin. Winter compounds the flooding emptiness within. Every echoing cough, blank smell, bland taste, weariness faint mystifies, aggravates, alarms us, and those we may taint. Our masked, vaccinated paranoia saves lives. We stockpile COVID tests in short supply. Positive, negative, false, true, results are misconstrued. In our tense state, we wait. Thank you. And now we will have Hillary Christ. Hi, this is called Remnant. This chilled morning, I grab my father's flannel robe and wrap his arms around me, imagining redolent cherry pipe tobacco and brill cream from my anxious youth. I couldn't know when I sent it off a decade ago, it would be my last gift or how I'd howl with news of his sudden death on the other side of the world. Hastening home from a business trip in New Zealand, blur of airports, featureless flights, scurrying back to New Jersey to unpack summer and repack winter, off to Chicago, remembering him sitting on the edge of my bed at night, making up stories, fanciful elves named How About That, or you don't say, joy before sleep. 
His final words at my wedding before he gave me away, you're the greatest. How my tall strapping dad declined over the years, hunched over a walker, and that last tight hug on a Thanksgiving night, our final goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we will now have our last open mic reader, Kyle Singh. So just bear with us as we bring Kyle up. Hi, everyone. Uh, really enjoyed the reading so far. Uh, this poem is called Ex Post Facto. Commotion of the onlookers looking on. We're not who we really think we are. And that dream you remember feels like it actually happened as you lie in bed on the edge of falling asleep. This line is blurred by the sounds that begin to appear, not in actuality, but as some fragment left over from the heaviness of your last meal of the day. Stop noticing the way you look into empty space, pent up and not getting the cue, so that it becomes apparent on the next day you're on the job that you've become a spy for mankind. Domesticated struggles move with each box filled with no secrets. Cardboard continues to be weighted down by the rain. Who has become the subject of this specter? Perhaps it is the UPS driver who's next in line for the sequencing of automation, like the genome, like the binary of the computer code, which allows me to become 16 years old again bound to my heart's first soliloquy, rambling about absolutely nothing. Look at the UPS driver again, carrying all of our collective weight. I know his name now, it's been so many years. When he sees my address, the boxes are all delivered with a small piece of paper, reminding me of what to order next, demanding me to make a decision quickly. The floor is pulled from under me, followed by some kind of paring knife that is drawn meant for peeling oranges, small enough to be carried around with you at all times. Following this is an embrace again, as I order a new set of Mattel toy soldiers molded carefully to scale. I've seemed to convince myself of just the opposite, that somehow my growth spurt had happened evenly, that I too was growing to scale. This couldn't possibly be true. The spurt happened in just a few weeks, and still, Shared experience stands alone as I remove all the mirrors from my house. This allows a congenial spirit in the room to be felt when people visit. The murmurings you hear turn into words that are parsed out and formed into disconnected sentences. Finally, you ask me that question, a guest remarks as they stare past you and at the floor. Now new threads can get made out in the head your ceiling becomes the Sistine Chapel. Looking up now, the stained glass is painted again as the conversation moves around the room. It was only ex post facto that I was glad for never paying attention to the words that were said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our featured readers, to our open mic participants. Um, I am grateful for the audience members who are here this evening. I'm going to put in the chat two links. The first is a link to a short survey that I'm hoping if you have the chance, you will take the time to fill out after the program concludes as we continue to try to learn about our audiences and always um, improve our programs. And then the second is the register link for the next um, poets at the library, which we are aiming to hold in person, assuming conditions allow, um, and that will be on April 18th. So we hope to see all of you there. Um, in the meantime, please check the library's page uh, events calendar to see if there are other events you're interested in. We thank you all for being here tonight um, and wish you well. Thanks so much.